And now, it's time for the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show with Snowden Bishop. Listen in as Snowden interviews cannabis industry pioneers, marijuana experts, policymakers, medical practitioners, patients, and other amazing individuals with compelling stories to share. It all happens right now. Here's the Cannabis Reporter, Snowden Bishop. Hi, and welcome back to the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show. I'm your host, Snowden Bishop, and I'm delighted you could join us today. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to pay homage to the late, great Senator John McCain, who lost his battle with cancer last week. I felt it was important to remember him, not only because he was an American hero who sacrificed so much in service to our country, or because of his long distinguished career serving the state of Arizona in the U.S. Senate, but because of the way he always put his love of country ahead of partisan politics, and even in the face of criticism from members of his own party, including the president. Few politicians have had the courage to stand up for what's right, not just for what's popular even when it defies the agenda of powerful corporate interests who have made puppets out of so many in Congress. John McCain was one of those few politicians who was humble enough to admit when he was wrong and defend the truth, even when alternative facts would serve his own interests. Senator McCain's brand of leadership was truly a beacon of integrity in an age when self-righteous politicians demonstrate more concern for their election campaign donors than the constituents who elected them to serve. It is rare when a candidate for public office would risk his own victory to defend his opponent when a voter reiterated hateful campaign rhetoric against him. He was a tough but fair lawmaker who embraced political challenges as an opportunity to bring us together as a nation. He was a true American patriot who cared deeply about the future of our country and the values that made us great, not just those of one side of a contentious political divide. As we consider the vacancy of his Senate seat, we would be well served to reflect upon the sanctity of the office he held and the honor with which he approached governance during his tenure in the Senate. While it would be impossible for anyone to adequately fill the void he left behind, we must reflect upon his legacy as we elect someone else to walk in his shoes. In these turbulent times when alternative facts are casting doubt on the truth, when hateful rhetoric is dividing us, When self-serving politicians are allowing corporate interests to chip away at the American dream, and when self-proclaimed patriots are defiling what it means to be American, it behooves all of us to reflect upon who we are as citizens of this great nation and consider how we envision the future we leave for generations to come. Will our actions bind us as benefactors of a great democracy or forever destroy the freedoms our founding fathers intended? As we look back on the storied life of a great leader like John McCain, we can honor him by embracing the values of honesty, integrity, and honorable service that he embodied. The choices we make today, for better or worse, will forever change the course of history and, more importantly, will determine whether we can survive to tell it. If we are honest with ourselves and with one another, We can learn to look deeper than political platforms and pursue a future that provides not just opportunity for peaceful coexistence and abundance beyond our wildest dreams, but a sustainable way of life that ensures that the next generation has every opportunity to enjoy a healthy life on this earth. That leads me to today's topic. The cannabis industry has potential to set the stage for a healthy, prosperous, carbon-neutral future and set a shining example of how we can adopt earth-friendly practices without sacrificing the bottom line. This is something our guest has set out to achieve, and I'm excited to introduce Derek Smith. He's the executive director and co-founder of the Resource Innovation Institute, which is a national nonprofit whose mission is to promote and quantify energy, carbon, and water conservation in the cannabis industry. Derek, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you joining me today. Yeah, thank you, Snowden. It's a pleasure to be here. So I was very intrigued by what you do. 
And I see cannabis as being one of those solutions to the damage that's being caused by unsustainable practices in industry in general. Tell me a little bit about how you got involved in this. It's fascinating. Well, first of all, I agree with your sentiment. I think that cannabis can be a vision for sustainable agriculture at large. Uh, and that's actually the vision statement for our organization. And we're, we're thrilled to pursue it. Um, and there's many obstacles in the way for us to get there, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, I came to cannabis about two and a half years ago after working nearly for 20 years in sustainability in a variety of different settings in, in corporations, in government, in nonprofit. Because I have never seen a bigger opportunity to have a positive impact on climate change by helping an industry that has a huge carbon footprint move through the process that a lot of other industries have gone through that is called market transformation, where you're actually moving all the levers uh, in concert to move and help an industry move along toward a low carbon outcome. So you're influencing policy, uh, regulation. Uh, utility incentives uh, and and creating market drivers like certification systems that can reward companies for taking positive actions and and that process needs to start with the collection of data and that's really what we're focused on at the moment I've always found it really interesting that the operations in the cannabis industry are very carbon intensive and yet the plant itself is probably one of the most carbon consumptive resources that we have that can make most things that are made out of fossil fuel resources, for example. And yet here we are where regulation really has made it a problem for people to use natural uh, light, for example, to grow their plants. There are so many restrictions. I mean, how do you get around the regulatory aspects of this when when encouraging people to take more sustainable measures and growing cannabis? Yeah, reg regulation is a significant challenge in a number of different ways. I mean, right now it's state-by-state -state regulation, and if a patient is trying to get uh, medicine in, you know, the winter in Massachusetts, you know, that, that would be hard to come by in a, you know, you can't just grow outdoors at that in that season in that region. Um, so, you know, to some degree, there is a need right now for electricity use in the industry to get patients medicine in certain areas at certain times of the year, right? Um, that is all based on a false economy, a false uh, regulatory structure that, again, is, is established at the, at the state level. Um, so I think some of that pressure will be lifted once we become federally legal. And then the question is, how will uh, these states that have been set up, and some of them with very inefficient infrastructure, how will they compete on a global stage with lower cost uh, production areas like Mexico and Colombia that, that are waiting to come online, um, where you know land and resources are, are, are significantly cheaper, and we figure out how to uh, uh, store the product over uh, months so that it can have a lower carbon shipment to whatever the market is that it's, it's serving. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how regulation evolves over time and how the markets uh, shift. Yeah, and I do believe, too, that there are so many aspects of cannabis that it will impact in a positive way environmental concerns that we have today, like everything from our water resources being contaminated with opiates, for example, <laughs> all the way down to the brown fields that are created from unsustainable farming practices and using cannabis as, an, as a natural resource to kind of clean up a lot of this stuff, but also replacing some of the pharmaceutical medicines that wind up in our water table. I mean, I, I'm really curious to know your background with working with governments, you're really coming from that sustainability aspect all around. Is that correct? Yeah. And again, I, I'm coming from the perspective that industry has an opportunity and a responsibility to take its share of the solution. 
uh, and it ha this industry has the opportunity to partner with government so that uh, the industry can shape the destiny that it wants for itself. We want, we don't, we're, we're already a very regulated industry and, you know, it's up to us to figure out best practices and to capture data and to set standards um, so that we can be self-regulated as much as possible, which will obviously benefit individual companies so they know how to uh, operate more efficiently, but in the bigger picture will help us as an industry have a better reputation, which actually I believe will help us uh, in, the, in the regulation fight as well at the, at the federal level. Uh, I talked to elected officials at the at the federal level who very strong who are trying to support cannabis becoming legal and and very strongly believe that if the industry puts its best environmental foot forward, uh, that will that will be part of the argument for uh, making that transition. And what are some of the major pieces of advice that you give to people who are in the industrial side of it as far as the grow operations? I mean, is it possible for people to go to completely clean energy to manage their facilities? Uh, I mean, yes, theoretically anything's possible. The question is, is, is a massive indoor uh, operation able to absorb into its cost structure, um, you know, acres of solar uh, that would that would be required to offset the uh, electricity impact of of you know growing at uh, with HID lights at twenty thousand square feet. Uh, I doubt it. Um, so the question is, um, the question is, how do you get started on a journey towards sustainability or I prefer the term resource efficiency over sustainability because it, it actually makes more sense. It connects directly to the bottom line. It helps executives see that um, choices that they make about reducing their environmental footprint actually help their economic uh, interests. Um, so I would I would encourage executives to think about um, taking one step at a time um, and looking at the the line items in their budget that are large and that are based in natural resources. Electricity is a great example. Um, and begin the process of understanding how to reduce that expense line item. And um, one specific way that, that we are trying to help the industry right now is we have a free tool, an energy benchmarking tool called the Cannabis Power Score, um, where Operators can enter data about the lighting technology they're using, the HVAC systems they're using, the production um, amounts that, that they're generating over the course of the year, and, and the electricity that they're consuming. And with that information, we can give them a benchmark and show them how efficient they're being uh, among the rest of the data set of about 150 farms that we have in the data set now, most of which have given us utility bills and they're willing to do that because they get that valuable energy benchmark that gives them a proxy for profitability and competitiveness but also because they know that we're a nonprofit and we're not going to share that data we're not doing this in a pay-to-play manner nobody's going to poach uh, on them to try to sell them technology and rather we're sharing the anonymous aggregate data with governments and utilities and manufacturers so that they know how to be how to help this industry be more efficient. And again, that's the way we get there is that the, the industry needs to partner with governments and utilities and manufacturers to help um, create the the future that we want, which is to be uh, regulated less and to have a better reputation. And it, it sounds like this is something that's going to be incredibly useful for uh, civic planning, for example. Like, I've heard horror stories about how some of these industrial grows are, are really tapping into a grid in such a way that it puts such a burden on it that it's impacting power like in an entire civic region. Have you heard this as well? Yeah, we've seen that um, the city of Denver's electricity consumption overall as a city is flat 
But as soon as the cannabis industry came online, got, was regulated, um, it has grown to 2%, and then now it's at 4% of the city's total electricity use. Now, that, that increase has partially happened because the industry is growing. That's a good thing for a host of, host of reasons for society. But the challenge is the city of Denver is not meeting its climate and energy goals, or, or at least they're under threat, because of one industry. And part of that is occurring because, to your point, decisions that are made at the local level, decisions that are made by local elected officials to zone the industry into one part of the city, which puts stress on that local electricity delivery system, and the infrastructure needs to be upgraded. In many cases, the industry or the actual operators are paying for those upgrades to the utilities. But the challenge is, for all electricity ratepayers, is if if this infrastructure gets built out for inefficient operations, and those operations go out of business because they are not competitive, then the rest of the ratepayers may be at risk for paying for those upgrades to the system. And so what we don't want to see is that the cannabis industry is blamed for an increase in uh, electricity rates. Well, and also tax rates. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, this could result in in greater tax rates for uh, industry stakeholders in addition to just people living in the communities where the electricity is being used. can imagine. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we're seeing at the local level uh, beyond electricity is in Denver, as an example, um, because all the facilities were zoned in industrial areas that are also near freeway exchanges, that are also near communities of color, um, we've seen that the terpenes that are coming out of the facilities are actually volatile organic compounds. And if they are in a large enough amount in the air, and then they mix with chemicals that are coming off of uh, out of the industry and off the freeways, then they're creating additional carcinogenic uh, air quality issues. And um, that's not necessarily the bulk of the individual cannabis operators, but we have to recognize we're part of a system, right? And that system includes local zoning and permitting decisions uh, that are made and borne out in an environment that we share with a lot of other interests. And it's in the interest of the industry to be a productive voice in figuring out solutions like that. That's the first time I've actually heard that. And by the terpenes, you're meaning the almost like the odor emissions that are coming from these growth facilities. Is that is that what you're referring to when you're describing it that way? Yeah. And I, this has been... Um, conversation with the Colorado Department of Environment and Health. Yeah, and I didn't even realize that the terpenes would be an issue in that regard because, well, you're the first person who's mentioned that when you're combining that with all of the other pollutants that are existing in these industrial areas, that combined, it's just increasing the VOCs and carcinogenic materials that are impacting the populations. I mean, this is really yeah. an interesting problem. And it sounds as though it could easily be solved by just not concentrating all of the grow facilities into those small areas, like you were saying. Yeah, so. it's, a, it's a volume and concentration issue. And um, I, I only point that out, and I'm, I'm really quoting what I've heard from the local government there. Um, I'm pointing that out to give the example that the industry is part of a, you know, an ecosystem that um, that it has the opportunity to play productively in and create an outcome that uh, is is a, a positive industry reputation and an economic environment that has reduced uh, environmental compliance. You know, if we can figure out how to do this right together as an industry, it's going to be an easier path forward. So are you collecting data only from members? Because I noticed that your organization is a membership-driven nonprofit, and you have a number of fairly substantial members, which are corporate members, basically. 
are you also going outside of your membership to collect this data as well? Or are you encouraging people to sign up so that they can be part of these environmental impact studies? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Cannabis Power Score uh, energy benchmarking tool is available to anybody to use. Uh, And in fact, we encourage it because the more data points we can get, the more we can establish what is good performance and what is bad performance. And we can help inform best practices and ultimately have the ability to create standards for the industry. So um, we have a membership program that has benefits to members. Essentially, for the most part, it's that they get bulk purchasing discounts on um, a bunch of different technologies and equipment that they use in their facilities with that may or may not be efficient, but through that bulk purchasing, we can help them reduce their cost structure so they can, you know, optimize profitability and help them make investments in more efficient uh, technologies and techniques. Um, So, you know, there's, there's membership benefits, which are separate from the general data collection and informing of governments and utilities that we're doing. That's absolutely fascinating. And what are some of the other considerations besides just, you know, the electrical grid that you think that is important for the industry to consider? Well, we're looking at energy, carbon, water, and waste. Um, And so if you look across that perspective and you really think about cannabis as as a system, you know, we really need to be looking at carbon impact and we need to be looking at, um, not just um, electricity, but also other fuels that are used. Uh, I mean, there's propane, there's generator use, uh, significant generator use, uh, particularly for backup power or power in regions like Humboldt, where, you know, they're way off the grid. Um, And we see, you know, a huge need to focus on policy, especially at the local level, uh, where we where we see elected officials making decisions in climates where it is entirely appropriate to be growing outdoors, <clears throat> they're banning outdoor production and essentially forcing the industry into warehouses, uh, and that is absolutely not necessary. Um, so you know we're trying to address a, a systemic solution to how we can serve patients in the most. Um, uh, resource efficient manner. And as far as like water usage too, has this been a problem? Do you think? Uh, I think if you look at cannabis and its water use, obviously, um, you know, it, it, it is dependent. The amount of water that is consumed is dependent on uh, the climate that you're in and, and obviously your efficient use of water. Um, and th- there are issues of water that go beyond just uh, the amount of water that's used, but how it's discharged in back into the environment. I think a lot of water issues. So, so if you actually look at, at at cannabis's water use, it's actually less than a lot of other crops. Um, I think a lot of times people who look at the issue of cannabis and water are conflating the illegal operations with the legal ones and um, looking at diversion of streams and 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 whatnot uh, for and and runoff issues uh, but the reality is the regulated market is, is a lot cleaner than um, the illicit market and we need to help inform the regulated market about best practices uh, and and levels of performance so that they can help themselves from a cost structure standpoint, um, but also they can relieve the burden on, on natural resources. And, uh, you know, again, that will only help the industry have a, have a better reputation. I've heard that about hemp, for example, as a natural resource for making fuel and textiles and that sort of thing. It's a lot less consumptive than say cotton and also, um, corn and other grains that are used for fuel. I think there's been a lot of effort to transition into that and the places where it's legal to grow hemp outside. But what are your feelings on it? And what would you tell policymakers about that? Well, I'm hesitant to say anything um, definitive in the absence of data. 
I, I think you're right. Um, but what I would encourage governments to do is uh, invest in data collection. Uh, Oregon was the first state to require energy and water reporting uh, from the industry. And I think that was very smart. Um, it is only through data that we'll, we will be able to figure out what are the best practices. Again, we don't know what is the most efficient way to grow cannabis in a certain region, in a certain climate zone, in a specific type of building or cultivation environment. Uh, we don't know how to combine the most efficient lighting techniques with the most efficient HVAC techniques in uh, an indoor or controlled environment, uh, greenhouse environment. Uh, literally nobody is studying that. Um, I hear from all the time from HVAC engineers. I don't know how to most efficiently advise a grower to go from HID lighting to LED lighting, how they adjust their HVAC, how they adjust their water, how they adjust their nutrients. Um, we need to figure that out. And governments can help by help their constituents have fewer natural resource impacts and get all the benefits of cannabis uh, including the tax resources to their local communities by making sure that the local businesses that they're there to support are the most efficient um, so that when the when the federal walls come down and when uh, Oregon is competing ultimately with Mexico, not just um, within its own borders, uh, it can it can be strong as an economic engine for the state. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. And you know, these are lessons, too, that I think are very, very important for the states that are considering any kind of regulation for the very first time. Because I think what we've found is that in a lot of states, they're not really communicating as well with the states that already have systems in place, like Oregon. Um, and Oregon's sustainability, you know, resource use aspect seems it, that is a very smart idea that they incorporated that reporting into their policy. So this is something that I think could be very instructive for the states that are regulating for the first time. And are you involved in any of of the initiatives that are coming down the pike? Yeah, in fact, we're funded by foundations in Massachusetts to help the implementation of that state's energy regulation on the industry, uh, which is the most ambitious energy regulation in uh, in the industry, in the country. Um, you're right to point out that uh, states are not sharing information, uh, and I would encourage California, as an example, to learn from the Massachusetts experience. Um, Mass the Massachusetts law uh, was drafted by uh, energy and climate experts who worked for the state who saw this massive tidal wave of electricity consumption down the line and that could threaten the state's progress on climate and energy goals. And um, the challenge is, you know, Massachusetts is moving very fast toward regulation and there wasn't a ton of uh, stakeholder engagement uh, from the industry as that law was getting created. It, you can imagine they are dealing with a number of regulatory issues as that market uh, opens. Um, so we're funded to help set the table so that uh, growers and operators can sit down with utilities and with uh, several state agencies and with LED manufacturers and with HVAC installers and architects and engineers and solve the problems that are that come with a, a lack of data and a lack of understanding of best practices when you essentially mandate use of LED technology, which is what Massachusetts did. Uh, that's what they're requiring at, for large indoor operations. Um, we would advise that States focus on the ways to uh, reduce overall kilowatt hour consumption rather than specifying technology. And, and again, really focus on data driven solutions that, that inform best practices um, and that, that are looking at the whole facility as a system 
so that it can reduce um, the overall electricity consumption in a variety of different ways rather than just one specific technology. It gives more flexibility to the industry and may, in fact, um, achieve better environmental outcomes. So how difficult has the transition to LED lighting for indoor grows been? Because I know that it emits different rays, if you will, that are a part of the photosynthesis of the plant. And I mean, natural sunlight obviously is the best, but how does it compare? How does LED compare to incandescent or, or ultraviolet lights? Or it's something I know very little about, which is why I'm asking. Well, so we have some resources on our website uh, that are is a, essentially a collection of the best peer-reviewed um, research that's being done out there. So, for example, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District did a study with a couple grow operations of comparing not just electricity consumption from HID to LED environments, but also looking at, at terpenes and cannabinoid profiles and, and whatnot. And um, what that study found is that the quality of the product actually improved and uh, or or was at least the same, while the cost structure and the environmental impact was significantly uh, diminished. So I think we need a lot more research, uh, but the indicators are that the technology has evolved significantly over the past five years because of manufacturer investment and a lot of great input from growers to those manufacturers about how to better serve their growing interests. Um, so, you know, I would encourage the growers who are anti-LED because, you know, six plus years ago, they've been sold by snake oil salesmen who were, you know, pulling LED lights out of uh, off of uh, assembly lines that were built for, you know, hallways and whatnot. So go talk with the LED manufacturers that are gaining reputations in the industry that are um, that have really good technology. They're really figuring out how to mimic that natural sunlight. Um, and again, you know, the the debate of indoor versus outdoor is a totally legitimate debate. Obviously, outdoor production has less electricity impact. Um, and, you know, there's a range of ways that you can grow. And I think it is the choice of a grower, um, you know, how they want to do that. And we're just trying to support knowledge uh, about the most efficient ways to grow in the ways that um, operators are choosing to grow. Because we recognize that these, these impacts are going to happen because of choices of operators. And we're trying to inform the most efficient pathways forward. You know, we've 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 held a an LED lighting workshop. Um, we had the participation of uh, several LED manufacturers and growers from multiple states who are um, who have made that transition from HID to LED, and um, we will soon be producing a, a, a peer-reviewed best practices uh, guidance document to help folks make that transition. Uh, you know, and will inform other other uh, efficient approaches as well. Yeah, that's that's fantastic, actually. And getting back to the water, I noticed an article on your site: uh, drain or reclaim. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that. I mean, how can people start reclaiming their water? Do they recycle it like in a gray water sort of way, where they'll collect what's being used? you know, in the initial grow and putting it back into the system after it's already cycled through the plants? Yeah, we're seeing condensate uh, recycling happening quite a bit. Um, you know, it, it, these are, anything you can do to recycle or reuse uh, is going to reduce your cost structure, right? So I, I would encourage um, anyone building a facility to, to make sure that they're teaming up with architects and engineers who can help them evaluate the system overall. Um, and and support um, the most efficient operation, you know, from the outset. That article was provided by Hydrologic, which is one of our uh, corporate members. And, uh, you know, they took time to inform uh, some best practices that they were seeing and, and also to inform uh, municipal 
decisions about how to regulate and permit at the local level. Um, so that that was the that was the gist of that article. Yeah, I saw that. So, what are some of the big takeaways? What what would you most want the consumer audience to understand and know about what it is that you're doing, and how can they become involved in this if they're not in the industry? I think consumers need to ask a lot more questions about the product that they're uh, buying and ingesting. And I think the retailers can uh, help by placing materials uh, from our organization and other organizations that are working on these issues in the dispensaries to begin that consumer education process. Really, the consumer will drive a lot of the demand for better environmental progress in the industry. That, that is seen in every industry, from organic to, um, you know, in the commercial building sector, the uh, LEED, Green Building Rating System. Our colleagues at the Cannabis Certification Council, which is based in Denver and focusing on organic, uh, promoting organic methods and uh, transparency among uh, grow operations, just started this campaign called What's In My Weed. It's a hashtag. People can go check that out. And the argument that they're making is you ask questions about your food and where it comes from, and you make decisions based on um, your knowledge of the source of that uh, food that you're putting in your body. Consumers are not doing the same thing on cannabis. And that, that again, that, that needs to happen. And, and I believe... Cannabis is moving into a, a more corporate environment and, and also a craft environment. And, and in both of those segments, in every industry, uh, there are educated consumers and educated shareholders that put pressure on companies to become more efficient and to become better actors. And um, that will happen in cannabis. It's coming right around the corner. And... Uh, the challenge is the industry is so distracted with uh, raising money and, and uh, meeting investor timetables and, uh, you know, adjusting to changing regulation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the time will come when corporate responsibility becomes a significant issue that this industry needs to uh, face. And, and I think it's coming very quickly. I think you're right about that. And one of the biggest fears that I've heard is that as the regulations relax, the more corporate interests that are getting involved and this threat of potentially adulterating the plant, <laughs> it, it, it does remain a risk, you know, and people cutting corners and all of that. So I think that the self-regulation is great right now, but ultimately the regulations that the industry imposes on itself should carry out through the growth of the industry when the bigger corporate interests start getting involved in this. I mean, how can we mitigate some of the future problems <laughs> of this becoming a more corporate environment, moving from the craft to the corporate? Well, I mean, I, I do believe that um, when industries scale, that corporations value efficiencies. And so I think we are going to see increased efficiencies. And, you know, I think the challenge for the industry is that um, commoditization is, is going to, um, you know, show up in the, in the strains that get brought forward. And, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of dilution of the value, uh, the huge range of values that the, that the plant offers. Um, but in general, I do believe that um, corporatization does value efficiency. And what we have to do is capture that corporate interest and ensure that as quickly as possible, it focuses on collecting data, informing best practices, establishing standards, and then, and then ultimately those standards, like you said, will get built into regulations and codes. And um, the more the industry can focus on that now, the less it's going to be regulated later, and certainly the less it's going to be regulated in ways that may not make sense for the for the industry. Right. Wow. Are you working with Focus or any of the other people who are trying to establish universal standards for the industry? 
Uh, we have been in touch with them. They're, they're focused more on sort of um, um, basic safety and health guidelines, as, as, as I understand it. What we're talking about is uh, a beyond compliance. You know, we, we ultimately are trying to create a, a differentiator for the grow operation so that they can capture more value at the price point and, you know, at the cash register, mm -hmm. while we're also helping them drive uh, the bottom line. So we're not trying to create a minimum standard for um, compliance. We're trying to create the opportunity for companies who are making good decisions and who are being the model actors to get additional benefit in the marketplace. What we know from working in a bunch of different industries is that the more you can get market-driven conservation, uh, the faster that conservation will occur. It, 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 you know, it's always faster if you can get industry to have a benefit to do it rather than be regulated into it. So, we, you know, we were founded by folks who, one who was an energy policy advisor to two Oregon governors, another who worked on utility programs throughout North America to help design incentive programs on different technologies. Uh, and then somebody who was on the board of the U.S. Green Building Council. So which created the lead green building rating system. So the idea initially was let's create lead for weed, you know, as shorthand for designing a system where an efficient operation could essentially have a stamp of approval that it was verified independently to have achieved a certain environmental performance. And then make sure that, that those actors are supported by a certification system that consumers can understand and value and that governments can recognize and, and give awards to. That's, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. But again, we can't get there until we collect data and actually uh, understand best practices. And, you know, that's why we have put all the stakeholders around our table to inform, um, you know, the most thoughtful solutions that can expedite the most quickly. Yeah, I keep hoping that industry at large will start embracing more of the lead principles uh, in general. And, you know, on the on the other side of the coin, also, I don't know if you've ever been involved with the Climate Reality Leadership Corps or if you are a climate leader in that regard. I went through that training with former Vice President Al Gore. And one of the things I found really interesting is that they're still not embracing cannabis as a, a sustainable resource solution for some of the climate calamities that are happening right now as a result of man-made carbon emissions, etc. And I've been really hoping that the people who are in the nonprofit sector in climate-related issues, that they would start in encouraging or embracing cannabis as one solution to start weaning ourselves off of dependence on crude oil and using hemp, for example, to make fuel yeah. and textiles and get away from the nylons and the, you know, all the DuPont <laughs> chemicals, cutting down trees to make paper and then using DuPont chemicals to mulch it into paper. It's, it's really... I think that there are so many solutions that hemp in particular can offer our world as we try to grapple with these climate changes and get into a more sustainable way of industry. How much are you in touch with people who are dealing with that kind of an issue from the environmental perspective? I just met with Senator Ron Wyden's uh, team this morning and got an update on, on the farm bill and where that's heading. And, and uh, it, you know, we've got Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul and, you know, the Kentucky delegation supporting um, hemp used in, in that, in the manners that you talked about um, through the farm bill, there seems to be a little more of a challenge on the um, uses of hemp um, in, in varieties, you know, in, in applications beyond, um, you know, fibers. But I think the, the, the feeling is that we're going to get there and we're going to get there by supporting the public officials um, or at least their positions on these issues. 
So it, it does seem, at least as it relates to hemp and the farm bill, that we're, we're heading in a good direction right now. Well, you might have even more of an update than I do if you've just discussed it with Senator Wyden. Where are we with this? Because I was delighted that there was just so much support for 7606 being in the Agricultural Improvement Act. Where are we in terms of actually getting the law passed? Well, I think, um, as I understand it, that there's not much that's getting passed right in D.C. these days. So I think, unfortunately, we have... Uh, we have a lot, <laughs> lot larger issues at hand and obvious chaos running through D.C., so um, that needs to be resolved. I'm laughing because it's uh, – <laughs> you're right. There's there's just so much else that's pressing out there right now that a lot of these issues that could really improve the quality of life for everybody in America have taken a back seat to the controversies <laughs> that are – that are uh, transpiring on a daily basis in Washington. It's very, very sad to me. But, and, you know, and also all of the environmental regulations that have been rolled back recently, it seems like every single day, and they don't make news. That's part of the problem. I think that a lot of people just don't even realize the deleterious effects of all of these reversals on environmental controls. Yeah, totally. I mean, all you have to do is look at Flint, Michigan to see what damage can be done. And yeah, it's it's quite uh, troubling. Yeah. It's always difficult to educate consumers about environmental issues. And, you know, I have to hand it to the voices out there that have somehow enabled humans to believe that they are separate from the environment and that that, that environmental issues are somehow at odds with human interests. I, I, you know, it, it's it's remarkable to me that people can't make that connection. Uh, but well, that's and it's where we remarkable, are. Yeah. And it's remarkable that our policymakers separate the environmental impact from the quality of life issues. And it, you know, it makes me wonder if they have children and grandchildren that they want to inherit the earth that we're creating now. Right. And the vital importance of it, I mean, you know, as a species, we're not going to be able to survive on the planet if we keep going at the rate that we're going, and unless we make some drastic changes in the very near future. I mean, and those of us who are educated on the impact that industry has on the climate and the huge body of science that's available to people, the proof is there. The proof is there. And and the rhetoric is not aligned with the proof that we do have. The These changes are really dangerous. And, you know, when you look at the fires and you look at the floods and you look at the hurricanes and the tornadoes and these severe storms and all of the changes that are happening in our Earth's atmosphere right now, and to not make that connection just seems ludicrous. And and for policymakers to ignore the science on it just seems rather criminal, if you ask me. <laughs> but, but yeah, well, I couldn't agree more. And the challenge is, you know, here here we the planet is burning. You know, you and I are both in environments right now that it's it's well over a hundred degrees. And we, you know, looking at the Earth from space, you know, it it is the planet is literally on fire um, from all these wildfires that are clearly because of climate change. But the problem is that government officials are not making decisions beyond a two to four year horizon. And frankly, neither are in industry leaders, including in cannabis, right? So they're somehow separating themselves from the larger problem at hand. And, you know, you have investors that are wanting market share and are, you know, not caring about the efficiency of the facility that they're building because they're going to be out in two years and, and they're not, they're either not making the connection that they're part of this larger system and part of trying to push forward an industry that can be more responsible and have a better reputation, uh, or they're just um, disavowing that for their own, uh, their own, you know, economic interests. And that has to be broken, right? And just like players in this industry can't assume that if they understand how to make their operations more efficient, that that's a trade secret and that they should keep that to themselves, 
you know, we used to be in that, uh, that world as an industry where we, we were fearful of exchanging best practices because we could get caught. Um, nowadays, we need to be sharing best practices because it will not only help us individually as operators, it will help the industry overall. And that is how industries mature. And that is how they increasingly have better reputations among consumers. And again, I honestly believe if this industry can increase its reputation, enhance its reputation, it, we will have a smoother path towards legalization. At the federal level. Yeah, absolutely. We will. Wow. Also, the thing that we haven't covered is the more efficient we can make the regulated market, the more equipped it is to compete with the illicit market. Think about that. Yeah, that's an interesting. And it's because it doesn't have to absorb all the tax burdens and the other burdens of, you know, the compliance burdens of the regulated market. But if governments and utilities and manufacturers and the industry leaders themselves can get together, and again, we're bringing all those players together in an objective nonprofit format, if we can all get together, we can figure out how to create the outcome that we want without inviting additional regulation down the line. Um, and we will push out the illicit market uh, and local governments will um, benefit from the tax revenues and the industry can, you know, have a much brighter future than, you know, the current calamity that it's facing from a, a, a bunch of different directions. Yeah, and I think that's just going to improve society at large when we can compete with the illicit market. We're going to push out a lot of the um a lot of the violence and and we're going to be spending a lot less as taxpayers on prisons, that's for sure. Yep. <laughs> it's another issue altogether. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that is a very important aspect of this. Is there anything else that you think that people need to know? Well, we're going to be producing a cannabis energy report in partnership with New Frontier Data over the next couple months. And it will inform um, cost structures and the energy share of cost of goods sold that, uh, that, that will be. Um, necessary to compete as the global marketplace unfolds. Uh, it'll be looking at what are the most efficient technologies and techniques um, to, you know, to grow this plant. And it'll inform governments and utilities and industry leaders about the current state of energy impacts of cannabis and how policies and regulations and individual market steps uh, can be made to, um, again, to create a, a better outcome. I think that'll be an amazing tool for industry stakeholders, but also I think it would be an amazing resource for consumers, too, as they start to make decisions about policymakers that are running for office. And yeah, it, it'll be very interesting to read that, I would think. So, yeah, yeah. well... I think the work that you're doing is amazing, and I encourage people to uh, log on to the Resource Innovation Institute website. It is a nonprofit organization. If you feel so compelled, you should make a donation. Big recommendation here. So, um, right on. Thanks a lot. It, you're welcome. I will put information about that on the website when this episode is archived. I am getting the signal, though, that it is time to start wrapping this up. So I just have to say thank you again so much, Derek, for being here. I really appreciate your input. Absolutely, Stone. Thank, thank you for everything that you're doing. And, and um, yeah, let's, 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 create, let's create the industry that we want. Absolutely. It's like the world is our oyster here, and we have an opportunity to make this industry probably the cleanest and greenest of any industry that can bring in billions of dollars to our economy. So this is, it's all fantastic. And thanks again, Derek. I really appreciate it. We have a great future to look forward to, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Thanks a lot. Oh, so it is time to bring another show to a close. Once again, I would personally like to thank my guest, 
Derek Smith for sharing his insights and knowledge with us today. If you're interested in learning more about the work that he's doing at the Resource Innovation Institute, please visit us online at thecannabisreporter.com. Click podcast to find today's episode, and there you will find his bio and information about the organization and links to his website. We have so many others to thank. First, I'd like to express our gratitude for our radio sponsors, Canisphere Biotech and Health Terra. We certainly couldn't be doing this without you. I'd also like to thank Eric Dahl, the composer of our theme song, Evergreen, the production team here at the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show for making us shine, and, of course, to our programming directors at XRQK Radio Network and Society Bites for distributing our show. And last but not least, Thanks to all of you for listening. I'm your host, Snowden Bishop, inviting you to join us again next week, same time, same place, for another episode of the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show. Until we meet again, be safe, stay informed, share what you've learned, and make it a great day. You're busy running around from work to kids to evening events. Healthcare shouldn't be adding to your daily running around. Simplify your healthcare with Helterra for only $15 per month per individual or $18 per month per family with up to nine kids. By the way, you can eliminate doctor office visits with 24 seven access to doctors via phone, video, or the mobile app. Not only do you get prescriptions filled over the phone, but save up to 85% on those prescriptions. This is a supplemental plan and not insurance. Healthcare made easy. Helterra.com.